So, how many, how many senior parents and students? Okay, great. Most of you. How many junior parents? All right, I'm with you because, as Christina said, I'm a junior. So, we're kind of embarking on this uh, process. We, uh, we did college visits in Texas uh, in June. If you ever did it in Texas in June, it's really hot. Um, that's what we found out. But I had a great time. Uh, I was banned from asking questions uh, since my son said, you know too much. I said, okay. Didn't know that was a bad thing, but apparently it is. So it was a fun time. And uh, it's, a, it's great to see the process through his eyes, uh, which is the eyes that need to see the process. Because you know, at the end of the day, he's the one going to cop. I'm, I'm not, we're going to drop him off, and I know it's going to be terrible, and, and we're going to cry, and all of that. But at the end of the day, he's got to love where he's going. Uh, you know, we can try to lay the groundwork and everything. And I did have a uh, kind of a sobering moment the other day, and you know, he just he just started to drive, so that's the whole other story. But anyway, uh, stay off the sidewalk if you're in Brentwood. So he, um, so you know, we're sitting there watching the Titans game, and you know, the Titans wins have been uh, kind of few and far between. And there was a moment I'm kind of looking at looking at him going. Oh my gosh, this, this may be one of the last times that we get to celebrate a Titans win together because he's going to college in two years. And that was, that was a little hard uh, to think through that process. So anyway, so I, I'm there with you. Um, as my colleague said, who, that I work with in admissions, he said, you know, he's, he's been in, in the business as long as I have. And he said, you know, I would talk about admissions and talk about financial aid and all that and talk to families, you know, both he and I both, he said, you know, until it was my own kids, I realized I didn't know anything. So until you're the parent and you're going through the process, it's different. And each kid's going to be different as well. So uh, so we're going to go through the, the slides. We're going to try to kind of go quick. I'm going to uh, leave a lot of time for your questions and try to fill in things that that you may think, well, is this a crazy question? It's probably not a crazy question. And we'll go through and try to answer as many of those as possible. You have a copy of the handout. Uh, by the way, uh, we, are being, we are being videotaped. So just yeah. so. Yep. So, so just so they can get me on camera. So if you're not supposed to be here, or you're supposed to be somewhere else and you ask a question, you might want to disguise your voice. Okay? So. So financial aid mess, just to make sure we're kind of level set on kind of the reality. Um, financial aid isn't available. That's not true at most uh, institutions across the country. They offer some type of financial aid. Uh, one, one of the other myths I always love is that you know, we should pick the college that offers the most financial aid. Uh, because that means that school wants my student poor. So, okay, I've heard that argument. Uh, it is an argument. I would always say you want to, you, you know, as a student, you want to pick the school that's the best fit that you can afford. Okay. Sometimes I'll talk to families, and, and it's about, well, let's start with the money first, and then we'll try to figure out if the money helps the fit. Does that make sense? Okay. Because the thinking about, well, the fit is better if the money's better. Well, no, the fit is the fit. You know, the, the bottom line is when. When you pay for tuition and housing and whatever else, you know, you're paying it typically at the beginning of each semester. All right, that's a you know, one-time occurrence each semester. I mean, the student has to be happy and doing well every other day the rest of the term, right? So, you know, that's the long-term view of that, okay? The best way to think about financial aid, especially the money that the school offers, it is a way for the school to help meet whatever objectives they have. Whatever they think is important, whatever they want to reward, that's why a school has financial aid. Now, parents and students look at it as a reward or as a discount or something like that, which is also true. But from the eyes of the school, it is something to try to entice a student to enroll at that institution. 
Financial aid is, uh, will only cover tuition costs. That's not true. There are some cases where financial aid will go above and beyond tuition because we know at most institutions, there's tuition, there's fees, there's books, there's housing, there's meals, there's all of those things. We'll talk a little bit about costs in a, in a minute, okay? Any questions on this slide? Observations? Rude remarks? All right. So this is where, and it's a little bit hard to see, it's a little bit easier to see on your handout, but this is just a look of all of the financial aid that went to pains for college, how is it broken down? Now there's some good news on here and some bad news. Let's start with the bad news. Whoops. Where's my pointer? The, the center button? The center button? There it is. Oh, there it is, okay, good. So you see that big long graph there at the bottom? That's federal loans. Yeah. So 34% of the money that's available for college comes in the form of federal loans. That's either a loan in the student's name or a loan in the parent name. That's not as much fun to talk about, so let's go to the next one up, okay? And that is institutional grants. That makes up 22% of the money that's available. So over half of the money that's available for college comes in the form of either money from the institution or loans. So if you're thinking, well, where do we start looking for money? Well, if you want to look for free money, look at the school. Okay, look at the school. That's the best source of money. The next one up is Federal Pell Grant. Federal Pell Grant is a federal entitlement program, and there's a slide in the back of your, of your presentation. Uh, we won't have time to get to that, but it talks a little bit about all the federal programs, federal loan programs, federal grant programs. Pell Grant is for the neediest of the needy of the needy of the needy. If you think, I wonder if we'll qualify for Pell Grant, the answer is probably not. Okay? Next up, federal education tax credits. On your tax return, if you don't make too much money according to the, to the federal government, we will not get into that tonight, okay? <laughs> that there are tax deductions that you get when you send a child to college, okay? So it's money that you don't get, you know, when you have to pay the bill, but when you file your taxes, it's a tax credit that you can get back if you qualify. Next up from that, veterans and education benefits. Next up from that, 6% private and employer grants. You hear about all the money that goes on claim for college each year? Okay, private, you know, scholarships to the Walmart Foundation, Coca-Cola Foundation, churches, as an example, may have scholarships. Your employer may have scholarship. Your student works at Chick-fil-A, they got a scholarship. That all fits into that, that bucket, okay? Stick grants. Next, the second one from the top, 5%. In the state of Tennessee, great lottery scholarship program for students that go to school in the state. And then the top is federal work study and FSEOG, which both of those are institutional money administered at the institution. The federal government gives a block grant and then the school uh, administers that. And there's information about work study and SEOG in the back of your presentation. So that's kind of the big picture of how college is funded. So the biggest takeaway from this is, yeah, there's loans and they're available. We'll talk just a little bit about that in a second. But the, the biggest source of free money, gift money, the best kind of money, is from the institution themselves. Any questions on the slide? Okay. All right. I like to show this to you because we hear about everybody that's in debt. Oh my gosh, people are just borrowing insane amounts of money to go to college. It's just out of control. Actually, it's not. This slide just quickly is if you have if you have borrowed a loan for yourself. Parents, if you borrowed a loan to go undergraduate, to go to law school, to go to medical school, and you borrowed a loan for a student, like you borrowed a parent loan, all of that money is rolled up together and, and is reflected on here. If you just borrowed a student loan in your own name, it's reflected on here. The biggest takeaway is that you take 39% and 28%, you add those two together, that gets you 64%, 64% 64 
64% of the borrowers in the country have borrowed $25,000 or less for college. Okay? You never hear that you know, on the news. Okay? So the vast majority of people have borrowed $25,000 or less to go to college. If you want to go up to $50,000 or under, then you add another 18%. So the vast majority of borrowers in the country haven't borrowed that much to go to college. Now, borrowing is always a family decision. But just understand, there are loans available, and what well, we always counsel people, you know, borrow smart. I mean, all that parents tell me, well, would, would you borrow $200,000 to send your child to Vanderbilt? And I'll say, have you met my kids? So, the answer is no. That's a joke. <laughs> Would I work $200,000 so much on the Vanderbilt? Probably not. Okay? I think that's an awful lot of money to borrow for an undergraduate education. Unless I thought, you know, they were going to graduate with a $200,000 a year job right when they graduate. Okay? They may think those jobs are available like that. Uh, I know differently. Okay? But I just wanted to give you a little bit of perspective on borrowing. All right, categories of financial aid. As you're going through the process, you'll hear a lot of terminology. This is kind of what, what everything means. You'll hear gift assistance. That's also grants and scholarships, okay? It's free money, and free money is the best money, because free money is the money you don't have to pay back. Do not confuse that with no strings attached. It's important that when colleges start making financial aid offers to students, need to find out what are the terms and conditions of the award. For instance, is there a grade point average requirement? The Tennessee Lottery Scholarship is a great example. You have to have a 2.75 to keep the Tennessee Lottery Scholarship as a rising sophomore, and a 3.0 as a rising junior or senior. How many of you have known someone who had a lottery scholarship and lost a lottery scholarship due to grades? Yep, about half of the students that start with a lottery scholarship lose it because of grades, okay? So, that's a you know, small, fine print thing that you have to be aware of. Also, if your student starts school as a biology major, and they have a biology scholarship, they come over with Thanksgiving, and they say, oh, you know what, I think I want to go into art history. I don't want to be pre-med anymore. After you're done crying, <laughs> then, you say, well, wait a minute, if you have a scholarship to study biology, what does this mean? Well, you want to ask this question before and say, okay, well, if, if I change majors, what does that do to that scholarship? In most cases, when scholarships are awarded in an institution, it's usually less about the major, especially as an entering first year student. Now, if they pick up a scholarship along the way, maybe they'll get a scholarship because now they're in the architecture program or something like that. But it's always good to make sure what are the terms and conditions about the free money that's being offered. The other thing is, if you don't remember anything else I say tonight, write the word renewable down. Okay? Is it renewable? Some schools may only offer that particular scholarship package for the first year. I don't want to say it's bait and switch. They sort of they feel like bait and switch. Okay, so I'd ask the school, what about the next year? <laughs> well, they can reapply, and okay, that's wonderful, but what does that mean for, for your student? So that's a really, really important part because unless they're duty hazard, students, you can ask your parents who duty hazard. Okay? <laughs> you know, it's going to be a four year thing, okay? Maybe five years, hopefully not six years. You get what I mean? Okay? Then loan assistance, that's the money that you borrow that's repaid, of course. And then work students, that's called the J-O-B. It's a job. It's where you actually, you, you go do something and you get paid. Okay? So, on some college campuses, finding a job on campus is easy. In some places, it's a little more difficult. If working is an important part of kind of how you're figuring out how to pay for it, so hey, you're going to need to earn about $1,000 a semester, you know, to help pay for expenses then find out from the school you know, how realistic it is for a student to get a job. You know, like in Vanderbilt, it's pretty easy because a lot of our students work on campus, there's a lot of jobs on campus, and so you know, those opportunities 
are pretty are pretty abundant. If it's in more of a college town, there may be more of a, a crunch to get a job. All right. You may hear the word self-help. Self-help is just a sexy way of saying loan and work together. So a school may say, we have a great financial aid program. Our average financial aid award consists of 60% gift assistance and 40% self-help. You go, oh, self-help, that sounds really nice. Well, wait a minute, that's just either money we have to borrow or money that we have to work for. It's not free. Okay? And then most financial aid is awarded either based upon merit or based upon need. Remember, merit is always in the eyes of the beholder. What's meritorious at one school is not going to be meritorious at another. And that's the part that's going to drive you crazy because trying to figure out what a school deems as meritorious. And some schools do not offer merit-based financial aid. I believe schools do not offer merit aid. They only offer need-based aid. And the need-based aid we'll talk a little bit more in a minute. Any questions over the slide? Brent, can you just comment maybe if a college offers a student self-help, do you have to take a loan? Do you yeah, have to get a job? That's a great question. Yeah, the answer is no. Just because a school offers it doesn't mean you have to take it. But then that's just, you know, you have to come up with the money, you know, that particular money, a different way. Okay? That's a great question. Because we'll have some students will say, I, I don't want to work. And, and that's fine. We don't make it. Okay. Anything else on the slide? All right. Big picture sources of financial aid. There's federal, state, institutional, and private. For federal aid, the basic form is the pre application for federal student aid. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's also the application for the lottery scholarship. So, students, if you're thinking about going to school in the state of Tennessee, and even I would say, even if you're not thinking about going to school in the state of Tennessee, <laughs> fill out the FAFSA, list a, list a uh, state of Tennessee school on there so you get into the state system. So if you decide to go to school in the state, then you can take advantage of the lottery scholarship. State financial aid programs, there's also, for instance, a Denver Order Scholarship Program that has a separate application that's typically available later on in the fall that's due around the 1st of January, and it's a merit scholarship program. There's also another state grant program called the Tennessee Student Assistance Award for students who also qualify for Pell Grant. But the FAFSA application is your application for those programs. Institutional financial aid, some schools will want the FAFSA. There's another form called the College Board Financial Aid Profile. Both of those applications, the FAFSA and the profile, they ask for parent income and asset information and student income and asset information. So it's one of those things you'll sit down, have your tax return, and you just start going at it, okay, and answering, and answering questions. The profile is used typically by schools that have a lot of their own institutional need-based aid. We use the form, Notre Dame uses it, Rhodes uses it because we all have a lot of our own institutional money that we award. Not all schools will use the profile. If you call a school and ask them if they use the profile and they ask you what are you talking about, they don't. And usually you can go on a school's <coughs> website and they'll tell you, hey, to apply for financial aid, here's what you need to complete. In that same vein, merit scholarships at an institution if a school has 20 scholarships, they may have 20 scholarship applications, okay? One for each scholarship. Most schools have tried to consolidate that down a little bit to where the, um, where the, where they can use a lot of the in information on the admissions application to do their work, and they may ask for a little, uh, some supplemental materials, it just depends. But ask the school. We've got, we're a great example, our merit scholarship programs, we've got three major programs, each requires a separate application. Every year, we'll have someone that will come up and say, well, you didn't offer me a merit scholarship. And it'll say, well, did you apply? What? Well, did you apply? Well, no, I didn't apply. 
I didn't know I had to. Okay, well, we sent you a brochure and we sent you three letters and it's all on our website. So, well, I just missed it. Yeah. And we're not going to come knocking on your door saying, hey, you, know, you didn't apply. You want to apply now. Okay. So the important thing is, is to understand from the school's perspective, what do you need to do? Deadlines are a huge part of this process, and, and um, Christine will talk a little bit about that process uh, later on, but deadlines are huge. And sometimes a deadline is a good idea, sometimes a deadline is an absolute. And the problem is you don't know the difference until you miss it. That includes deadlines that the school has, but also deadlines for your counselors. Um, Christina mentioned that, that I do work with Boy Scouts and I'll write recommendation letters for my Scouts. We have a letter due tomorrow recommendation and we have a letter due in a couple of weeks recommendation. Which one do you think is better? It's the couple of week one, okay? If you, if you need it tomorrow, I'll get you one, but it's going to be pretty vanilla, pretty generic, and it's not going to have a lot of substance to it. Pretty much, you can just take your name out and put anybody else's name in there, and it would fit. You know, they're great kids, they've never burnt anything down, you know, they've never run over anybody with their vehicle, you know, all of that. Okay, so deadlines are important, are very, very important. Then, private opportunities. There are a lot of scholarships out there. There's some really great scholarship tools. Uh, FastWeb is one, collegeboard.com has one, and there's a slide in here that has those websites on there that you can go out and look for various scholarships that may be available. Any questions on the slide? It's okay. We have a full tuition scholarship for the first question. We have to get the application in? For the full scholarship. Yeah, right now. I'm sorry, you just missed the deadline. I'm so sorry. Yes. The FAFSA. Yes. Free app for federal student aid. My child's not living in Tennessee. Yeah. But you're saying I should fill it out in case Tennessee or for yeah. all states. I, I would say typically fill it out regardless. There are some schools that say, you want to apply for merit aid, you want you to fill out the FAFSA. And I say, well, why do I have to fill out the FAFSA? It includes all my income, because that's our rule. I mean, I, a friend of mine that I worked with, his daughter, went to, a, went to a school, she had a merit scholarship, and she had to fill out the FAFSA each and every year. I know that because he complained about it each and every year. And you're saying not just for Tennessee schools. Absolutely. Any state. Yeah, and honestly, when I'm talking, I'm talking across the country, really the difference in the state of Tennessee, the big difference is you've got the lottery scholarship to the fast. Yes, sir. So what is the sequence of this? Do you, do you apply to the school, get accepted, and then start applying? That's so a great question. Do you apply to like nine schools and you're not going to the So it's going to depend. <clears throat> Typically, the best thing to do is to write out all the schools and then start writing out deadlines. Okay, when does the school want the admissions application? When does the school want the FAFSA application? If the school requires a profile, when do they want that? As a general rule, you apply for admission, you apply for financial aid, maybe one a little bit before the other or one after the other, but typically you don't want to wait until you find out whether you're accepted and then apply for financial aid. So I'll use Vanderbilt as an example. In our regular decision process, the application for admission is due January 1. The application for merit scholarships, those are due January 1. Our priority <coughs> deadline for the FAFSA and the profile applications are due February 1. And then we notify students of their acceptance by April 1. At that point in time, if they've applied for merit, they've applied for, for need based aid, with their acceptance letter, we send out the financial aid award letter at the same time. Some schools are a little bit more choppy 
but schools cannot make an offer of financial aid to a student until the student is accepted for admission. Does that make sense? So they have to be admissible before the school would send out a financial aid award. So it's the big, it depends. The thing about the FAFSA and the profile, you complete them once and broadcast them out to the different schools. So you write down the deadlines of the FAFSA. Okay, school X needs it on November 1st. School Y wants it on December 1st. School Z wants it on January 1. Well, your real deadline is really then November 1st because that's when the first school wants it. Does that help? And Brent, can I jump in? I don't want to contradict you, but for rolling admissions colleges, which a lot of our students look at, like Knoxville and Chattanooga, those applications for admission, you probably want to do those first. Those the kind of the earlier the better. The yep. selective colleges like Vanderbilt's are January 1st, but the um, rolling admissions schools, you, the students who do the applications usually first is usually not very time consuming to do. Yeah, because may, may or may not require recommendation letters right. and, and all of that. Right. And they all have a priority deadline, like November 1st for admission at Knoxville, and you may not have done a fast foot by then, and that's okay. Yeah. And really, the, the, the big spreadsheet, I mean, I mean, it's not, you know, I've known a lot of families that have done that, you know, listing out the schools and listing out when's the admissions application due, when, when are merit scholarship applications due, and trying to keep organized. I, I would say that whoever's the most organized in the household, they're in charge of this process. If it's the 10 year old, great. Put them in charge of it. You know, tell them we're giving five bucks every two weeks. They'll love it, right? But, but it's important, organization's really a key. And you know, from your student's perspective, they should think of it like this is a big class project, okay? A big project that has a lot of pieces that have to be put together as they go along. Great question. Yes? So other than the, uh, the Tennessee State's Hope Scholarship, mm -hmm. the, the uh, lottery, as you said, are most scholarship programs awarded basically to students whose GPAs are really high or have really high ACT scores? Yeah, great. It depends on the school, okay? <clears throat> but most schools, especially most of your state schools, they'll have merit scholarships and they're usually driven by grade point average, test scores, that sort of thing. Many schools will have, if you get this ACT score, you get this scholarship. You have this GPA, you get this scholarship. And that's just part of that discovery process and figuring out you know what do they what do they value and what how do they award their money? How do they do their business? In other words, so the schools that we visited in January, I mean in June, I wish we visited in January. Um, you know, kind of having a conversation with my students, say, okay, you know, these are the types of financial aid programs that are available. Hey, you know, to get a, to get a scholarship at this school, which will make your life easier because it makes my life easier is you, know, you need this ACT score, or you need this grade point average. And we just kind of sprinkle that in the conversation to go along, okay? I'll say, hey, this is great. Your mom will not have to get a second job if you get the scholarship, and won't that be great? You'll go out there. <laughs> good, good question, yes ma'am? I'm, I'm just curious about early decision at schools. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a great tool called Net Price Calculator that most schools will have. Each school is required to have a Net Price Calculator. If you're looking at early decision at an institution, especially if it's binding, I don't know how you're going to go into that, binding early decision. Early decision is always binding, so yeah. Early okay. admission is not, but yeah, early yeah. decision is always binding, yep. So, yeah, it's a good idea to have an idea of what kind of aid that would be offered before you apply, just so you know that you know, there's no sense in applying early decision binding if you know we're not going to be eligible for that much aid and we can't afford it if we get accepted. So the, the, the universities and colleges that have it nice and that's pretty accurate or pretty close? Our, our experience has been it's very accurate. If the information is put in is accurate. Okay. So occasionally we'll talk to a family and say, well, you know, the, the financial aid award you gave us is a lot different than what we had on the net price calculator. So 
So do you have a copy of the results? Yeah. And they send it to us and we go, okay, well, these numbers are different here. And we'll go, oh, okay. Or we had one that they put down that they had two in college when they're only going to have one. And that's a huge, that makes a huge difference in the analysis. Okay. Early decision, binding early decision is, is always something, it, it's, a, it's a good conversation for your student to have with their guidance counselor to kind of walk through that and make sure that that's the appropriate path to take. It's great, but it's not great for everyone. I would say it's great for a, a, a subset of students. It's probably not great for the majority of the students. Anything else on this? <clears throat> okay. Potential problems of the aid process. Uh, believe it or not, name, date of birth, and social security number sometimes confounds people. Uh, especially fathers when they're filling out the application, all right? <laughs> so, you know, they get, they, they, you see you and you go, well, you, that's me. Well, no, you's not you, you's the student. Oh, okay, well, yeah, that makes sense. Social security number. Oh my gosh, I, you know, we put the wrong social security number on there. We put the, we put the sibling social security number on there. So, legal name, real social security number. Remember, the federal government does not like giving financial aid to people who are not real. So that's that's really important. Again, we already talked about deadlines. Be aware of each of the deadlines. <clears throat> also, if you're applying for need-based financial aid, you may get selected for what's called verification. And verification is typically providing additional documentation to the school to verify information that you provide. You are not being audited. It is not an audit. It's usually a couple pieces of paper and you're done. Okay, so don't, if that happens to you, it's okay. About a third of all individuals get selected for verification through the federal application process. All right, when we start talking about need, yes? Uh, maybe this is a detailed question, but when they talk about household size number in college. Yes. If you have, you know, four children, but your oldest is going to school, you yes. still don't know they
Does it, on active duty and discharge, is a graduate student, or a couple other things, you know, they're going to be considered a dependent student all the way through their undergraduate <coughs> career. So it has nothing to do with you claim them on your taxes or anything like that. Um, they can't for some of you, I mean they can, but it's not really going to help in terms of the, the financial aid process. So uh, families should be evaluated in their present financial condition. One of the things you always want to ask the school, you want to ask them a couple of things. Certainly, if your income changes, you know, you've, been, you've, you've had overtime and now that's gone away, or you know, your spouse had to, had, to, had to cut back on work because of something, or you get laid off, or something changes you know, in the with the family's finances. That's something that you can always talk to the financial aid office and see if it makes a difference. One of the things that makes a difference for us and schools like us is the amount of money paid in elementary and secondary tuition at a private school for siblings. Not that that might affect any of you, I just threw that out there, okay? Money that is paid for siblings, not for the applicant, but for siblings attending a private elementary or secondary school. Some schools may say it was your choice to send your child to a private school. Fine, then the answer is no. They're not going to do anything. Some schools will go, yeah, let us know and we'll take that into account. The profile application that I talked about, there's actually a question on there that asks that. And you get to put in the amount. Is that on FAFSA? No. No. No, unless you can get in that little box. You know. But no, FAFSA doesn't care. Now, if something the school, though, if they, want to, if they want to count that or do something with that, they can. It has to be within their policies to do that. For our institutional need-based money, we certainly take that into consideration because about, gosh, it's a little less than half of our students come from private schools. Somewhere between a third to 35% attend a private come from a private school. So how do you suggest handling that? So if, if we have kids applying to the school that takes the FAFSA, you know, we have another student here, and, yeah. and I want to know, for example, you know, do, does that impact them? Do I need to fill out the FAFSA and then contact the financial aid department and say, hey? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, fill out the FAFSA and then you contact the financial aid office. It doesn't matter. And, and it shouldn't be, oh my gosh, that's a crazy question. I've never heard of that. I mean, that's, that's what we that's what we do. It's a common, it's a very common question. Yes? How does it work? Should you come up on one of the institutions that says, oh, well, that's your deal. If, you're, if they're in private school, um, is it possible to, like, take home equity, pay the school, and then it just looks like you have debt on your home to make it? <laughs> yeah, you know, so... So if I get the if I get the numbers wrong, so father rise tuition is roughly uh, fifteen thousand. So if you take that out of home equity, only about five percent of that home equity we're looking at in terms of what a family can contribute. So it's probably not make, you know, making a big deal because if you were going to pay tuition out of savings, well, savings and home equity to us are the same. Okay, okay? there's not going to be any difference. Okay, the only thing that would be different is if you put it on a credit card. We're not going to give you credit for that because we don't give you credit for personal debt. Okay? That's a, great, that's a great question. Yeah, personal debt typically isn't included. Now, you can always, you can always throw it out to the school and say, hey, you know, we had this happen, you know, a tree fell on our house, and, you know, we had to put it on the credit card to pay for it. Um, I mean, I, I've heard all sorts of different things. I, you know, you can throw it out there and see Never, it never hurts to ask. Okay, so how we determine financial need? You've got your cost minus what we expect you to pay. The expected family contribution, that's what's driven by the FAFSA profile applications. We're determining what we're going to expect you to pay. Okay? And that manifests itself in a dollar figure for 
that nine month period of time, okay, for that particular year. Theoretically though, really that's a, that's a, a way of evaluating a family, evaluating their, their uh, financial strength, really over a longer period of time, just not the nine month period. But most you know, families will look at that expected family contribution and go, you people are crazy. Okay. Uh, rare is it that I have a family that says, you know what? Oh my gosh, that, that number you guys came up with, that was right on. You know? We always we always figured we could expect to pay that much. No. Okay. So, this is full disclosure and full warning. If you haven't gone through a calculator, it's probably a good idea to do that. How many of you have done some type of a calculator to estimate your second family contribution? Okay. We're in a, we're in a, well, one of the best religious school, religious schools in the city, so I know there will not be poor language. What was your reaction when you saw that? Oh my? I laughed. Okay, no, laughing is good. Not really. I was saying it was crazy. The number was crazy. Okay. Yeah. Typically, what we're going to expect you to contribute, you're going to look at it and go, okay, that's a little excessive. Okay. But it's important to understand it, it is what it is, and it, it's pretty consistent from school to school. There may be some adjustments like you know, for things like we talked about, but so it's important to understand you think, okay, well, I, know, I think we're going to be eligible for a lot of need-based aid because our neighbor was eligible for a lot of need-based aid. Okay. Neighbors are horrible sources of information, by the way. Horrible. Okay. If any of your neighbors see each other, I'm sorry. Okay. You guys will lie to each other and say your student got a scholarship and they didn't. I mean, all sorts of things. Right? I know because I hear the stories. Well, so and so said, well, what? I look at so and so and go, well, that's not even close to me, right? So, anyway. But, but it's important to get level set as you're going through this because, you know, to help, to help guide that process as you're going through. Now, I think it's good that. You know, parents, when you're having conversations with your students, say, okay, you know, there's a limit to what we can do here. So if you're shooting here, great, okay? But we're going to have to wait and see what that financial aid offer looks like. So, you know, before you fall completely in love, you know, let's just make sure that, that, that we're kind of tempering our enthusiasm you know, there's a couple of things. Number one, if it's a if it's a competitive school, can you get in, right? And then second, is it going to be affordable? Can the family can the family swing that? The great thing about American higher education, there's a lot of great schools at a lot of different price points. Okay, you can get a great education and not have to spend an arm and a leg. Maybe a leg, maybe a foot. No, no. Okay? But a lot of different prices. Does that make sense? You know, it's, it's possible to get a great education uh, in a lot of different places. Again, it gets back to you know, more about school fit and all of that. I saw a hand. Yes, sir. Yeah, so is this process of financial independent of a merit case? Yeah, it's usually completely independent <clears throat> of merit. So that's a great question. So if you get a merit scholarship, does it does it replace the expected family contribution, or does it go to meeting the need? It goes to meeting the need. So the only way you get around that expected family contribution if all the money is merit-based aid. Okay. Okay. So let me let me give you a, a for instance. So for instance, you have let's say the school costs thirty thousand dollars. The expected family contribution is 10, so the need is 20. <clears throat> well, let's say the school, you know, the school says, okay, we're going to give you $20,000 in aid, you know, $15,000 of it's in grant money, $5,000 is in a loan. Okay, so $20,000. Well, along comes the biology department and say, you know what, we're going to give you a $25,000 scholarship. Well, well effectively, that $25,000 then wipes out the other 20 that was given. Okay, so now you're just left with a merit scholarship of $25,000. And if it's a school in the state of 
state of Tennessee, then the additional money on top of that for life. Okay, does that help? And a lot of times, you know, a lot of this you don't know until you've gone through the process. And so a lot of it is just trusting the process, trying to have an understanding of how it, the big pieces kind of fit together, applying for everything, applying for admission, applying for all sorts of financial aid, and then kind of sitting back and waiting for those offers to come in. Yes, sir. You say you, you do not hear about a financial aid package from an institution until you've been accepted, so. Correct. And it seems like depending on the college or university, you might not know how that's going to play out because every place can be somewhat different. Right. So how do you know what you can't afford going in? Is there a certain percentage that typically applies as a guideline? Or I don't know if we're just seeing our pants here. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there, there's not, you know, using the calculators to help understand where you are in terms of need-based aid is important. If you can kind of get a gauge on merit-based aid from the school based upon how they do their business and doing those types of things. And in the big picture, the schools give you until May 1st, if it's through the regular process, early decision is a whole different story. May 1st for the student to make that decision, okay? So if the school says, well, we want to know right away, hey, well, fine. The student can go ahead and accept the award. That's great. But, but there's, no, it's, there's no obligation for that student to attend that school. The student has until May 1 to tell the school whether or not they're coming. Okay? Because that's the agreed upon candidate's reply date. Now, if you start in October, man, it's a long time between October and May 1. You know? So, but it may, it may take that long. Is that... Yes, so you should exactly be applying for admission and financial aid and get all the financial offers, admission offers throughout this year. Um, some students are already being admitted to colleges. Some students applying to Vanderbilt will not hear until April 1st and then get their financial aid at the same time. But every college should give you until May 1st to officially say, yes, I'm coming or no, I'm not. And that way, have seen all of your admission offers and financial aid offers. Yes. The whole scholarship, is it pretty much an equal dollar amount that's given to most incoming freshmen? Yeah, it's, it's set. So entering, entering first year student, $3,500, okay, for a four year school. Uh, a two year school, I can't remember now. I don't know either. Uh, I think, I want to say it's $2,500, don't quote me on that. Maybe a little less, but yeah, it's, it's based upon, if you go to a four year school, either public or private, it's a, it's a larger amount. If you go to a community college, it's a smaller amount, but it's the same amount for everyone. Okay? It's not, you know, hey, you got, you know, you know, this school has a little bit more than this school. No, the big differentiation is between a community college and a, and a public school. And there's, uh, in the back of the, of the handout, I've got information about the lottery scholarship. Okay? Um, one thing, Cost can be really confounding as it relates to trying to figure out what a school actually costs. So just kind of do, do some digging. The standard elements of a cost of going to school, if your student's living on campus, theoretically, or not living at home, theoretically, if you had a wad of cash and you gave it to them the first day of school, how big a wad of cash would they need? start the first day and get them home after the last day. So that's tuition, fees, room, housing, books, an allowance for transportation, and an allowance for personal, you know, pizza, pop, movies, toothpaste, hopefully, laundry, maybe, you know, all of those things. The thing about cost that you want to ask the school, first of all, are there different fees associated with taking different classes or different majors? Some schools can fee you to death. Okay? So always ask about the different fees. The other thing is housing. Some schools may, may report a standard amount, but if your student lives in the Taj Mahal, they may pay more. 
Or if your student lives in the dorm that's just about ready to be condemned, they may pay less. So sometimes you have to tease out that, that particular information about costs. Okay? A couple more things about need. Remember, the cost of attendance can vary from school to school. In theory, the, the contribution that the families are expected to come up with stays the same. So you may have a school that's more expensive, that at the end of the day, there may be enough financial aid to make that school as affordable as another school. The key thing that you always want to, want to remember when you're comparing the cost of schools, it's, it's the net price. And the net price is defined as the cost of attending the school minus the free money. Okay? It's not what the financial aid award is, because that award may include work, it may include loans. Well, those are great, and they can help pay for things, but that's just, as we talked about, that's just money that either you have to pay back, or it's money that you have to work for. So net price defined as the cost minus the free money. And that is a great way to try to compare costs from school to school. And then ask the question, okay, what about the second year? What about the third year? What about the fourth year? If it's merit-based financial aid, what are the terms and conditions? If it's need-based financial aid, do you have to establish need each and every year? Or do they say, you, once we say you're needy, you stay needy all the way through? And if you're starting with one in college and then you have multiples, I would ask the school, hey, you see the, you see the younger brother over here? He's going to start college too. What's going to, is the financial aid award going to change for your other student as they go through? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. A couple of things on the free application for federal student aid. The FAFSA is now available as of October 1st. How many of you have had uh, children in college before? Okay, forget everything you ever knew about the FAFSA. Throw it out the window. It's a, it's a whole new game now. So, FAFSA is available as of October 1, and the FAFSA for 17-18 will use 2015 income information. So when you go out to fill out the FAFSA, they'll say, do you want to use the IRS data retrieval to pull in your tax information? My suggestion is say yes, and it will pull in your tax information for 2015. And you're saying, well, our income for 2016 is different than 2015. What should I do? Talk to the financial aid office. Okay? But the base year, if you will, will be 2015. For the 2018, 2019 year, the base year will be 2016. Does that make sense? Okay. So, FAFS is available October 1st. Uh, again, remember, you and your refers to the student. Read the instructions. Um, I'm horrible. I hate reading instructions. I just want to get it done, right? Read the instructions. Fathers, slow down. Yeah, it's not a race. I'm saying that to myself. Okay. And also, we're going to have a FAFSA night here November 8th, uh, 16th for seniors if you want assistance with your FAFSA. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. FAFSA night and wine tasting at the same time. Be that sounds great. <laughs> you need wine with the FAFSA. So. Um, I'm pretty sure November 16th, that's a Wednesday. I'll, I'll send you an email, but it's on the calendar. Yeah. It is not the, it, it may seem intimidating. It's not, honestly, it's not that bad. It is not that bad. We've never carried anybody out of our office after a FAFSA, you know, episode. So. <laughs> Profile, kind of the same way, is that uh, for the 2017-18 year, we're using 2015 income. Quick question. Yes. Can you comment real quickly on differences between FAFSA and profile besides like? Yeah. Why you guys use it versus FAFSA? Because we like torturing families. <laughs> so, actually, we get more information on the profile. It's a more in-depth look at the family circumstances. I always call the profile the it's the FAFSA form on steroids. Okay? But honestly, in the analysis, for most of our families, especially when we get to about a family income of about 80000 and higher, they actually show more eligibility on average on the profile application than they would on the FAFSA application. 
And there's about five or six major reasons why that is. But it's important for us because it does give us a better breadth of, of uh, a family situation. Also on the profile, you can actually tell us what your special circumstances are. The FAFSA doesn't give you that opportunity. Okay. Understanding your financial aid award. Know how your award was put together. Know if it's merit or need. Because when you, if you go back to the schools, you know, the question I always get, well, can I negotiate the financial aid award? The question is, I don't know, but the answer is going to be no unless you ask. Uh, a good friend of mine who happens to be a judge, so he's very good at negotiating, you know, was going back and forth between two, two different schools. It was, basically, it was merit money, okay? But you know, he basically got the two schools in a bidding war for his student. What can be better? Right? Okay? So that can happen. It doesn't necessarily mean it will. I mean, if the school offers your student a full tuition scholarship and that's it, well, it's probably not full tuition plus. It's they award that scholarship as a full tuition award. But you don't know unless you ask. So ask. Absolutely ask. Okay? Again, we talked about this before. Know the terms of each of the program that's offered. And then I've got some tips on there and how to appeal to a financial aid award. Okay? Do not start at the chancellor's or president's office. Probably not a good place to start. Start at the financial aid office. I always say, start nice. You can always get the nasty later. If you start with nasty, there's not a whole lot of other places you can go. Right? Uh, get the names of the people that you talk with. They're real human beings. Uh, most of the time, in most schools, you can find people's email addresses in the directory that's on the school's website. Okay? Don't show up at their house, probably a bad idea. Don't call them at home on the weekend, probably a bad idea. You know? But have a conversation with them. I think the best conversations I have with families, when they're knowledgeable about the process, and it's okay to say, listen, help me understand. It's always the Colombo approach. Help me understand. Help me understand why you offer this this amount of money. School Y, which honestly we don't like quite as much as your school, but totally acceptable school, good opportunity for, for the student, but they're offering more money. Can you help me understand maybe what the differences are, and is there any way we can get a little bit closer? Okay. Perfectly legitimate conversation to have with the financial aid office. And they may say, you know what, it's need-based financial aid, unless there's a change in the family circumstances, there's not much we can do. Okay. Or they may say, well, let me see. Let me go to my manager and see what we can do. Okay. I mean, you don't know until you ask. All right. A couple of different things, that's what the financial aid office does. Resource books, nobody reads books anymore. So, online resources. Collegeboard.com, finney.org. Both of those are really, really good sources of information about the process. Okay? Yes? Is there a specific website for the profile? Yeah, collegeboard.com. We'll get you there. Yes? student has a merit-based scholarship, what happens if that goes away? It depends. If the school has need-based aid, need-based aid may kick in. Well, yeah, if you were accepting either one, do you know the financial yeah. and, that, and that's a question to ask the school. We'll have that. We've got, we've got a few merit scholarships, and we've had the situation where they lose the merit scholarship, but they're eligible for need-based aid, then that takes over. But it's going to depend on the school. If the school doesn't really have any need-based aid, that they administer, just maybe loans or something else. That's the, you know, that's the question to ask the school, kind of a what if. That's a great question. Okay. That's the lottery scholarship section. We don't, we're not going to take the time to go over that. It's pretty self, self-explanatory. I am exactly two minutes over. Can I take one or two more questions? Yes, please. Okay. <clears throat> 
What else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I, I want to try to understand the expected family contribution. Yes. So we went online and we plugged in our numbers and here was this insane number that there's no way I can pay. Okay. And so I look at that number and I think, okay, so this is the amount that they're expecting us to contribute. Right. Am I correct in understanding that that amount means we cannot borrow that from in a federal loan? Is that right? No, you can't. You can, always, you can always borrow the expected family contribution in a, in a parent loan and maybe also in a student loan, depending on, you know, the student loans got a, uh, student loans to the federal government have a limit, 5,500 as a freshman, 6,500 as a sophomore, 7,500 as a junior and senior. And that information is in the, in the back of the presentation. So we, we are, a, we can qualify regardless of any other circumstances. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Work, right? Like, we right. need to apply for a loan if we so chose to pay that, to borrow that difference. In the, in the federal parent loan, you can borrow up to the full cost of attending the institution minus any other aid the student receives. Okay. okay. There is a credit test. It is not a sanity test. Okay? And it's actually just basically your kind of your standard old credit. Does the family have any 30, 60, 90 day delinquencies? They don't do credit scoring or anything like that. And do parent loans start, do you start paying them right away? Or does it work like the student loan that you pay after June graduates? It's kind of yes to both. Yes, you have to start paying, but there are deferments that you can, that you can employ and forego that principal, although the interest keeps accruing. Yes? Can we talk about student loans? Can we co-sign those? On student, student loans, through the federal government, no. To the student's name. Parent loans are completely in the parent's name. There are some other private loans that are out there. You know, Discover has a product, Wells Fargo has a product. In many cases, the student takes the loan, but typically the qualified parent has to co-sign. So basically, you know, you're you're in it together on, on those private loans. What's that? It's effectively a parent. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes, ma'am. contribution, Well, in the federal methodology, there could be a, a family contribution of zero if the family's income is low enough. The student, it depends. If they have no assets and if they haven't been working, then their portion of that contribution could be zero. Okay. One more. Yes, sir. Uh, 529 plans. Ah, yes. How are those viewed? Remind me in terms of like assets or how does the school view those? Yeah, in most cases, 529 plans, the parent is the custodian and then it's considered a parent asset. Uh, it's not considered a student asset because technically those 529 dollars can be moved amongst you know, various uh, siblings. Okay. You, there's, one, there's one more question. Yeah, one more? I don't want to eat into your time. Yeah, fine, I don't you. want you to charge me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said that parent assets, they only look at 5% of the assets. That's kind of on the average, especially on the profile, that, that's the case. Um, and there's also some allowances in there. It's not exactly 5%, so I can't, you can't tell me we have this amount, and I'll say, that amount will, will factor in the contribution. It's a great thing about the calculator. You can go in and, you know, you can spend the money all on paper on a Tahiti vacation in your mind and, and see how it impacts the eligibility for A. Yeah, and actually retirement plans are not included. The corpus of those retirement plans are not included. So if they're not included, No, no. The, the corpus of those plans. Now, if you have a beach house and you go, that's our retirement home, I don't have to count it. No, we're counting the beach house. I actually had, you mean I have to count my beach house? I actually had a parent <laughs> ask me that. And I'm, I'm, yeah, 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 actually, we, yes, we are going to count the beach house.
Now, what it does ask, if you, the money that you put in and give it here, that you elect to put in, that's considered untaxed income. Okay, so out of my check, let's say, you know, $5,000 over the course of the year I'm putting into those plants. Yes, that is included as income, but that corpus amount, whatever, whatever I have in there that's gaining or losing money, if we lose money today or we gain money today, probably lost money today, um, you know, that's not included. So, does that help? There, there is actually a question on the profile. They'll ask a question on the profile, but I don't know any school that uses that information. But it's definitely not on the FAST. Okay. All right. It's all yours. Well, thank you to Brent for coming tonight. We really appreciate thank you sharing your time with us. Good luck to your student. What can you have with this? Thank you. We're, still, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to figure out where, uh, where our next visit's going to be. And win. So, Thank thanks. You so much. All right. Well, as I said, I'm willing to stick around and chat with you all um, about the access application process. If you need to leave, please, please do. Um, I will just really quickly before I take questions, I just want to show you all um, that on the uh, the Blackbot Resource Board, we have a lot of information for you all, and there's information on scholarships. Just want to draw your attention to it. Um, and I do want to just clarify one thing in the, the questions you all were asking. The FAFSA is um, accepted by every college in the country for consideration for need-based aid. So it doesn't matter if it's Tennessee or not. Um, and for the HOPE scholarship, um, in order to earn the HOPE scholarship, a student has to earn a 21 on the ACT or a 3.0 GPA as calculated by the state of Tennessee, not the Father Ryan GPA. Okay, and we'll go more, I can talk more about that with you later. But if the students are 21, they've automatically um, got the HOPE scholarship for their first year of college next year. Okay, so this is the resource board on Blackboard. And if you click this link, there's all these different things that I hope you'll find more helpful, um, including I get a lot of questions about scholarships. This is a list, it's a very large list of independent scholarships that, for which you should be aware. It's a 10-page PDF. Uh, the top is a, these are search engines to, to look for lots of scholarships. So if you have a tuba player, left-footed, you know, loves to read specific kind of student, you can find um, perhaps scholarships. And then a big long list of all these specific ones. These are typically non-renewable. They're typically not the big money. As Brent said, the big money is usually from the college. Okay. So with that said, I'd love to just answer any questions y'all have about what your seniors are going through right now. So what can I answer for you? Well, fill me out the FAFSA. This yeah. Year, there is going to be a we're going to have the evening at Father Ryan, November 16th, I'm pretty sure. We just had to reschedule it. And we're going to allow you to come and go, bring your laptop, and I'll have you, I'll give, send you a checklist of what to bring. We're going to have a gentleman here from the Tennessee Student Assistance Corporation that gives the hope. He'll be able to assist you submitting the FAFSA. Um, it's, it, it can be a bear. Can and be a bear. can you apply to the whole scholarship or it's just a lot of something automatic? As long as you do the FAFSA and let's say Tennessee College on the FAFSA, that's the value to apply. After graduation, I will submit information to the state of Tennessee about students' GPAs and, <coughs> um, and ACT scores, and that will get sent to the financial office at Knoxville and Chat and Vanderbilt and Belmont, et cetera, to deduct that $3,500 from the first year tuition. So there's no application for the hope. And there's no, it doesn't matter what your income is. It's just a 21 ACT or a 3.0. But hope doesn't apply to colleges like Belmont and Vanderbilt. It does. Any college in the state. Try for public. But it's a set amount, $3,500. Which obviously $3,500 goes a lot further at Chattanooga than Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. But yes, absolutely. And, and then the point that Brett was trying to make, you know, about half our students will go to college at the state. We do have a not insignificant number of students who transfer back in state at some point. And if you qualify for the HOPE now as a senior and you do the FAFSA now, then you're qualified. And if your students for the first year at Mississippi State and then comes back to Belmont, they will get the HOPE their second year of college when they go to Belmont. So you do want to do the FAFSA for sure. Just, just as an, you know, you never know. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We've heard that if, you're, if your child is wanting to make sure I think that's not available in the state school in Tennessee, that right. they can get in state tuition. 
Right, so this is called the Academic Common Marketplace. <coughs> I'm a little nervous to try to find the website, it's kind of a bear, um, but that is, that is the truth. So for instance, um, I'm trying to think, golf course management or something like that that's not offered at any public university in Tennessee. And I think it's at Mississippi State, perhaps, and a couple other colleges. So if you go to Mississippi State for golf course management, you pay, I believe it's their in-state <coughs> rate. I believe is what it is. Student has to stay in that program, right? If student changes to our history, then you go to the normal out-of-state fees. Um, but yes, it's, I, it's the academic common marketplace. So if you Google it and you can't find it, email me and I can send a link to it. It's, it's a little clunky. So then the, 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 the Tennessee State colleges, do they apply to that? I suspect not. I suspect it's only if you're in state in Tennessee. So. Yes, ma'am. On that same subject, um, I spoke to Auburn because they offer software engineering and they don't in the public colleges in Tennessee, and they told me it would not kick in until her junior year hmm. if, it, if, if it did equal fall. I wonder if that's because maybe it's a program which you don't start really the program until your junior year, but your first year is doing general engineering, mm -hmm. you know, gen ed for engineers is my guess. I mean, if that's what they told you, I'm sure that's right. There's some very random majors. I mean, there's some, there are some dance majors. There's some, some very specific majors that, as you would expect, you know, that list changes year to year as different colleges and public colleges in Tennessee change their curriculum. Other questions? How are the seniors doing? They're applying. I know, like 28 percent have applied now. If I go to my my front page of Naviance, um, it shows me. I don't know if y'all can see here, but 28.7 percent of our students, of our seniors, say they've applied. So just to the, the parents where the students go to request that um, that me or Mrs. Nordman, my, my counterpart, send transcripts to colleges. Um, and just a reminder, it is the student's responsibility to send the test scores, ACT or SAT. We do not send those. That way they send their very best score. Okay. Yes, ma'am. On, on the ACT scores or SAT, mm -hmm. whichever one, if they've taken the test a couple of times, <laughs> If the first time they didn't put any colleges in, mm -hmm. will it still pull that first score also? No. Or just the second score? No, it's very clear when they <laughs> log on to attstudent.org of exactly the June 2016 test or the September 2016 test, where it's been sent and where you want that one test score to be sent. Okay. So, for instance, if you're applying to Knoxville, Knoxville does super score. And so if you need to send them two scores so they can super score, you have to send both both of those test scores to not still let them super score okay, themselves. So if you didn't send the first set, then you should probably go back in. If it's, if it's high enough that it would super score. If a student earns a 25 the first time, earns a 28 the second time, I wouldn't send the 25, I would only send the 28. Okay, okay. great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Seniors, how are y'all, we have a few seniors, how are y'all feeling, are y'all stressed out? A little bit? Well, anything else I can answer for you all? So like I said, we are having a fast tonight. I will email you about that. Thank you all for being here tonight. It was uh, great. I think Brent did a great job. And bless how we can help. But we, we're, all, we're getting there, guys. We're getting there. So y'all have a good night. Thanks so much.